Uh, we've got four really awesome alumni who are here. Uh, you guys come on up, please. Welcome our four alumni guests. Like Alex McConduit from Fundat. Come on, give a round. <laughs> Brett Cooper, Garage Machine? Garage Media. Brett Cooper. <laughs> Blake Durham is visiting us from jolly old England. <laughs> and Victoria Adams just down the street at Idea Village. Give a round of applause, please. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. <laughs> How does it feel to be back? A it's little cool. surreal. I got lost. <laughs> you guys miss forum, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. I thought we talked about this earlier. You miss forum. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I used we to miss it, it a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys all do different things, and I was wanted to kick it off by having you all give a super quick 60 second noisy projector screen coming down. <laughs> Let's go. Okay, 60 seconds of what you do and why you're here. Alex. Um, so Alex McCann do it. Uh, I used to do Crescent City Radio. Where's Crudy? Crudy's in here? Yeah, no. Yes. Uh, <laughs> there he is. Uh, uh, children's author for the last three years. The little who dad who didn't. Snowballs for all. Thorn in my horn. Last week launched Fundat. It's a reward-based crowdfunding platform for projects created in or about New Orleans. So you guys check it out. Started at Startup Weekend with this guy over here uh, earlier this April. And we started from Startup Weekend, and now we're here. All right. Man. Please. Mine, yeah. Uh, I'm Brett Cooper. Um, I uh, am a web analytics consultant for a company in Boston uh, called SE Jones. I've uh, been working there for about three years, lead analyst there. Uh, anything web analytics, uh, anything to do with structured markup, I'm there. Um, E-commerce to regular lead gen sites, generally B2B. I know that's a lot of like acronyms and stuff. It sounds boring, but it's actually really fascinating and does apply even on small sites and things like that. About a year ago, I started a web development company. We've developed our own e-commerce CMS. Actually launched two weeks ago. Kind of a running theme, I guess. Um, we uh, basically are focused on logistics, so we started from the inventory level, um, getting small businesses to better expedite their, uh, their sales from web to the real world. Um, and uh, tracking sales right the way through that, so tying dollar value to every interaction with a website. Uh, it's, it's pretty cool stuff, and yeah, that's about it. Okay, awesome. Blake? Um, let's see, since I graduated in 2010, I did a master's in contemporary musicology at Goldsmiths in London, and since then I have started a PhD at the University of Oxford in the music department. What's, um, I never heard of that, what is it yeah. called? <laughs> Yeah, it's old and it's it's totally bizarre. And, you know, people joke that it's like Harry Potter, and that's kind of true, but it's way weirder than Harry <laughs> Potter too. Um, I feel pretty out of place. But anyway, I'm doing an uh, interdisciplinary PhD affiliated with the Mu Music Digitization yeah. Mediation Research Program. I am doing an ethnography of a private BitTorrent tracker community. Um, I'm studying music consumption, basically, and how music circulates, and I'm doing it, it with a bit of contrast to um, streaming services and talking to artists <laughs> and individuals how new media has changed the way they consume and produce music. Awesome. Uh, Victoria Adams. I am the Director of Content Strategy at the Idea Village here locally. Uh, so the Idea Village is a local entrepreneurship hub. Uh, we have a suite of programs that caters to about a thousand entrepreneurs annually. Um, I manage all of their public programs. So all of their keynotes, uh, seminars, programs, uh, New Orleans Entrepreneur Week, for those of you that are familiar, uh, that's our annual festival slash conference focused on entrepreneurship um, that draws about five to 6,000 people. So I produce all the programming for that, um, as well as our fun parties and networking events. Awesome. Alex, um, we met at Startup Weekend. You put together Fundat at Startup Weekend in April. So you can go to fundat.com, just the, that's the blog, FYI. That's the blog, okay. Yeah. 
Anyway, yes. You need some help in your SEO, maybe, from this guy. I do, yeah. <laughs> Talking about so I heard that it's a nonprofit. Is that true? I'm sorry? It's a nonprofit? No, it's not a nonprofit. We're a for profit. Okay. Uh, <laughs> LLC. <laughs> No, but I, I, I toyed with that idea though. Nonprofit, yeah. I just didn't know enough about it actually getting into it. So, but no, it's not so a nonprofit. So you took the easy route of making lots of money. <laughs> cool. <laughs> no, it's cool. So, so Fundat's focused on New Orleans. Right. So we are focused on projects that are either created in New Orleans or about New Orleans. So similar to Kickstarter or Indiegogo, um, it's a reward-based crowdfunding platform. And we are looking for, basically, if you're in the city or in the greater New Orleans area, you can pretty much post a project about anything. But if you are in New York and you want to post a project about a New Orleans Creole restaurant, then you can post a project as well. So the restaurant would be here in New Orleans? No, it, it can be in New York. The projects just have to be in some way uh, about New Orleans. About New Orleans. And so to me, the thinking was that whether or not the, the restaurant was actually here, you would still have the impact um, from having a Creole restaurant in New Orleans. So you might visit it and say, oh, okay, now I want to go to New Orleans one day. Impact. So the impact of the site is to spread the idea of New Orleans. The Just the, uh, it's the, uh, the, the, the idea of the site is to help people in New Orleans who have ideas or people who have ideas about New Orleans get access to funding that they may not be able to get from a bank or from a rich uncle. Um, and, they, and the idea is that they can harness the power of the crowd and their crowd right. Right. and monetize it. So if, if you're not Mitt Romney, you're not going to borrow money from your family like he recommended. So, but, but just really quickly, to put you on the spot a little bit, oh, we, I know Kickstarter's like pretty awesome, right? Kickstarter is awesome. I'll take nothing Pledge Music's pretty awesome. Yeah. If you've seen that one. Uh -huh. So, like, what's the value add with Fundat? So, well, again, so talking about Kickstarter, uh, one thing about Kickstarter, as we all know, is if you don't reach your goal, you don't get the money. And to me, with crowdfunding, while it's not something that's, you know, <coughs> deathly hard to do, it's not easy. And so for me, I think that if you raise $999,000 of your $100,000 goal, you should still get something. Okay. Uh, also, on Kickstarter, there are thousands of projects. And so when you, if I visit Kickstarter, I don't necessarily have an organic connection with all of these projects. But if I go to Fundat, uh, if, I, if I log on to Fundat.com, I obviously have some fine feelings about New Orleans. And so that's kind of the idea about, that's one of the value adds. And then also, we are hands-on with our projects. So if you're in New Orleans, we put on workshops. We've already, <clears throat> since September, put on six workshops. We actually tried something really cool where we filmed videos for our projects, or at least just the pitch part. Like where they oh, you helped them make the pitch video. Yeah. Nice. So, uh, so that was kind of like an experiment, but it worked out. Uh, we had 15 projects who we helped out with that. And then we also kind of um, mentor and consult, help you structure your rewards give you an idea of what running a crowdfunding campaign is like from studying so many crowdfunding campaigns over the last couple of uh, months. Right. Uh, we have a little bit of expertise on so it. So you're walking people through step by step. You're kind of helping right. them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Right. Email, social media, what type of messaging, all of that type of stuff. Which is, I mean, Kickstarter is just like self-serve. You just show up and... Most platforms are self-service. Yeah. Like, so after you hit the, the publish button, they tell you. They say, hey, go out there, make it happen, spread the word. Um, and so with Fundat, we're kind of looking at it like we are analog. We're an analog platform in a digital crowdfunding okay. world. Kickstarter can't touch their projects. Yeah. It's too many. One more question to put you on the spot a little bit, because <laughs> I like to do it. Start a weekend part two. Yeah, exactly. So isn't that a lot more expensive? Um, so as of now, I mean, <clears throat> I don't know how much it has cost me yet. It cost me a lot of time, and I'm tired. Yeah. Um, so I mean, to be honest with you, we're still kind of figuring out what our program is going to be. We've learned a lot since last Tuesday, <laughs> as Ethan would say. What is Ethan? What's up? Um, so yeah, it, it, it eventually, I guess, that model will be. But even if we can just have our monthly workshops, if that's, if that, hopefully that may be enough to where we can coach you up before you come out. 
And aside from that, maybe you can email us, you can call us, those type of things. So, so you're working toward how you're going to productize it a little bit. Yeah, we're trying to figure out what our support is going to be. We do want to support our projects. Uh, we know that we're going to continue having our monthly workshops where we educate the community. And still, a lot of people don't even know what crowdfunding is. I mean, a lot of people don't know what Kickstarter is. So when we go out there, Fundad is kind of top of mind for a lot of New Orleanians now because they haven't even heard of crowdfunding. Nice, nice. Okay, we'll go in more depth on that in a minute. But, I, Brett, I have to ask you, you threw out a, a bunch of terms that I did, some yeah. of which I don't even know. So right. please, illuminate us. You said um, primarily the business is doing what? So, um, the consulting piece, right? Um, you, you have two things, I forgot. Yes, yeah, yeah, so uh, I switched to being a consultant when I started, my, when I started Garage Media. Um, so the, uh, the consulting piece of it I got into about three years ago. And the whole idea is that there are a lot of websites out there, but a lot of people throw up their site and they go, great, what happens next? Uh, and there's a lot of data that's being generated by people visiting your website. You know, Every single interaction has some sort of dollar value or could lead to something that has some sort of dollar value. So uh, people like me come in and basically go through tag, structure, check, uh, markup. Um, that's where you lost me, okay. Yeah, yeah, markup. So, you know, websites are made of essentially three languages in, in essence, right? Or they're made of three things. They're made of the outline, which is generally HTML. They're made of uh, the sort of image design overlay, which is generally, well, it is CSS, some flavor of it. And then they're, uh, they're made of motion, which you is- You guys basically deal with all this stuff. Yeah, some fork of JavaScript. Yeah, all that stuff. Gotcha. I spend my life line by line. Um, in this kind of thing. And what are, you, what are you doing with that exactly? Uh, so I go through and make sure that it loads quickly. I make sure that things like button presses, file downloads, uh, navigations are searchable. So, you know, not just for the people that visit a website, but also Google. Google is sending spiders and crawlers out across the internet indexing everything, mm -hmm. like basically taking snapshots. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that everything on a site can be found. And there are thousands of ways things can go wrong on a site. If your site was built more than five years ago, maybe you've got a terrible CMS and maybe you need to start from scratch. So a lot of, you know, basically it's project by project, it's extremely time intensive and it pays to be, you know, sort of up on these things for people. Because a lot of business owners just don't have the time. Right, so I, I think I'm understanding at the top level what you do, but like, give me an example of why? Uh, so I'll give you a very good example. There's a company called Beckman Coulter, which is one of the largest um, medical device manufacturers in the US. They're one of these companies that owns all these other companies you've heard of. Um, their corporate website was built about 10 years ago and uh, had at the time what I would imagine was a very, very cool loading screen. You would go and you would pick you know, the country you were in and you know, then you would pick like the state you were in and all this sort of stuff. It looks really flashy. Yeah. Like, like I said, 10 years ago, it looked really flashy. The problem was that most users had no idea how to get through it. And uh, Google certainly didn't know how to get through it. So for all of the time and effort they put in into promoting their website through various other paid channels and social channels or whatever, uh, it wasn't leading to anything in terms of their, you know, how they were displaying when Google was searching, somebody was searching for one of their products. Um, so it comes it, down to the fact yeah. that Google matters so much. Basically, I mean, yeah. you know, there are other search engines, but really it is Google. I mean, there's Bing, but nobody really uses that unless you're using Siri on your phone. That's about it. Ah. Uh, yeah. And so this is mainly for big business? I mean, with, with SE Jones, that's like, obviously you're probably working with big companies. Yeah. Talk about a site that was built 10 years ago. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, so this is, this is how I make my living is consulting for companies through SE Jones and okay. through other places. And so I'm just curious, like, how is Garage different? So Garage, basically, that rebuilding process, right, what I found is that most companies can't afford my time, mm -hmm. or they can't afford SE Jones's time. Mm -hmm. um, what we did and what I did with a, a, my partner who does actually what I do, but for just for the Marriott Corporation, we got together and we said, okay, you know, Let's pick a niche, and one of the things that ke kept coming up is there's a lot of like small business owners, a number of whom were our friends, who were trying to sell things online, and they were looking at various platforms for doing it. And I just sort of said, you know, there are some good options. Squarespace is a good option. Yep. There's a service called Shopify that's a good yep. option. But in order to really achieve the level of customization they're looking for, 
you have to learn some level of proprietary language. You have to get in there and learn their system. You can do something that's free like Joomla, or WordPress, or something like that, but then there are security issues. And most people have no idea. They, they basically learn enough to get the site up, and then after that, if somebody violates their security or you know, implants some code in their site or something, they don't know how to fix it. Um, and I, I was basically like, I was answering all these questions all the time. I was like, well, I can probably build something small that's going to help my friends out, right? That was essentially where it started. So we got together with a friend of mine. We did some mock-ups, um, developed a front end. It's called Maya. It doesn't have a website at the moment because we only launched two weeks ago. We launched our first uh, client on it. Uh, Peak Logistics is the company. That's P-E-K-E -E Logistics. And this just a kind yeah. of condense it. This, this product is to help you manage your website in a way that's going to be secure yeah. and built the right way so Google sees everything. And, and so it's fast. You know, time, time to get up is fast. So okay. you know, if you come to us with all your pictures and all your written content, we can get you up in about 10 days. Okay. And for e-commerce, that's pretty quick. You know, and that's with all the tagging and tracking and analytics set up for you already. Nice. Um, we, like I said, we've run a demo with our with our first client launched about two weeks ago. We're getting ready to onboard a second one, hopefully by the end of this week if they sign the contract. Okay. Um, but you know, we're just trying to we're just beta testing right now, trying to scale it and see where it goes from there. Okay, cool. So before we get into your work, Blake, I need to ask because I just thought of this. What can Idea Village do for these companies? <laughs> well, Alex is already a client of the Idea Village. I see Alex about once a week. Um, but really, the Idea Village uh, has a suite of programs to cater to early stage entrepreneurs. So I would say our programs fall in three primary buckets. Uh, the mm -hmm. first would be strategic consulting. Um, that's primarily targeted at high growth, very scalable companies. So the majority of the companies that are going through one of our accelerator programs um, is probably slated to do about five to $10 million of revenue in the next two or three years. Um, so that's kind of one portion, and that is really focused on growing the business rapidly um, and ensuring quick success and like a solid go-to-market strategy. Mm -hmm. um, the next bucket, I would say, is capital access, so helping entrepreneurs get access to funding. So that would be an option. Um, we have several different programs that do that, um, the bulk of which culminate in New Orleans Entrepreneur Week, uh, which is kind of our hallmark festival and conference that takes place in March. Um, and so that is from friends and uh, family, which would be kind of like a crowdfunding example, which is what Alex is doing, all the way up to venture capital, which is like a million plus. Um, so there's the capital access piece. And then where I work primarily is really in the education and innovative thinking sector. Um, so that encompasses a couple things. So we have free workshops that take place once a week that you guys are more than welcome to come to. Um, and every, they, every week? Every week. Every Wednesday, 3 to 5. Okay. Um, and those are really centered on kind of high level tactical business education, so things mm. you could take and apply to your business tomorrow, um, but also innovative thinking. So we bring in people to really talk about emerging trends in entrepreneurship and kind of hot topics, emerging sectors. So we had a guy come in and speak about growth hacking. Yeah. Um, someone from Google Play and Debo Google Glass last week and talked about emerging business opportunities opportunities for business owners, specifically using glass. Really? Yeah. Um, like so like, um, well, they're, they're releasing several different apps. Um, yeah. They're looking for innovative uh, business ideas to further develop those capabilities. Okay. So I mean, you always hear people talking about Google Glass and kind of like, oh, well, you know, one day I'll be able to walk into a room and your LinkedIn profile will pop up. Does everyone so know Google Glass, by the way? You guys know Yes, that? no, maybe so. The scary glasses that are kind of ugly too, but. Right. Yeah. Weird screen in the corner. Yeah. We demoed those last week. Um, so yeah, so, so they come in. So they came in, demoed up to probably 25 entrepreneurs, um, mm -hmm. and just kind of thinking through what are some new uses because I think they're kind of seeing that wearable technology isn't going to be necessarily a you know <laughs> widely consumed type of product. It's probably going to be something that's very niche, mm -hmm. and business might be the direction they head with that. Mm -hmm. um, so a part of my job is first and foremost serving early stage entrepreneurs, and so really figuring out what is applicable to their business. Um, and so and that's not just the high growth, you know, the next Facebooks and Googles of the world. It's mm -hmm. also like, you know, this. Uh, there's a great chick, Sarah Gromko, who has a yeah, music management no firm. Sarah. Yeah. yeah, Sarah has come to a bunch of our programs because it's really about just making whatever your business is the best mm -hmm. that it can be. Um, we see a lot of musicians that come through who really want to better understand business so they can handle their things better. Mm -hmm. um, so we see a lot of that. So my job is really catering to them and really understanding what across all entrepreneurs what they need. But it's also doing a bit of brand integration. We have a ton of partners at the village, a lot of sponsors, most of whom are national, um, Google being one of them. Mm -hmm. um, and they want to access entrepreneurs and highlight what they're doing and figure out how to do that in interesting ways. Sure. And so my job is really taking, you know, 
Google comes in and says, okay, I want to do a program with K through 12 kids helping to teach them about entrepreneurship and digital literacy, mm. I have to take that back to my team and say, okay, how are we gonna do this? Do we have any existing partners that we can leverage? I say, oh, Drew Brees called last week and also wants to do something with K through 12. Let's put Drew Brees and Google together happens to me all the time. and plan a program yeah. for New Orleans kids. That happened last week. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of what my job is, is, is providing resources to entrepreneurs at the very top level, but really sure. bringing all these different partners and companies and brands together to deliver something really cool. So you mentioned something briefly, music. Yeah. You were in this program. I was in this program. And did you work in the music business at all? Yeah. Oh, you did? Yeah, I did. I did. Um, so definitely while I was in school, I was a bit of a busy bee, kind of worked all over the place. Tipitinas primarily. I worked in the bookings office during the day and worked Will Call at night. Mm -hmm. um, then immediately following that, I worked for the Recording Academy. So I was the uh, Grammy U rep for the Memphis chapter for a year. I uh, did that, and then I worked for an independent label as um, AR slash tour manager. So I was on tour for a little over a year oh, yeah. um, with um, a girls group. Um, mostly domestic tours, I would say probably northeast and southeast, a little bit of the Midwest. Um, but did that for a year and a half, and then found the village. So this is actually my first non-music industry job. Okay. So you're in this role, you've been at the ID Village for three years, I yeah. think? How much like overlap do you see with the music business? And What's funny this? is I see a ton. Do you really? Yeah, I, you, you wouldn't expect it based on how I just described my job, but I mean, at the root of it, it is kind of providing some type of entertainment to an audience. Um, so I think it's important for my workshops to not be just kind of your basic business 101. Like I always approach them with a very innovative slant, yeah, and, yeah. and at the root of it, it's really thinking about what's going to be valuable for your audience. This is the same thing that you do when you're planning a show. Sure. It's like, how, what's the best way to promote this? Who do I need to have in the room? Who would be people who might want to fund this, sponsor it, throw their label on it, give me a free space to host it? So so many of the things that I was doing as a student at Loyola, I do now. Um, it's just a different audience. And do those audiences ever overlap? Like, do you ever interact yeah. with Tipitinas through Idea Village, or yeah. is there? Yeah, so I, I would say definitely with venues, because like I said, we host events around the clock. So over the course of, the year, we probably host 500, maybe 600 events. Um, and obviously, we can't host all those. You host office. 500 events in a year? Yeah. OK. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in the past month, we've hosted maybe 40 events. Um, not all of which are public, but okay. yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, interacting with venues is definitely one piece of it. Um, I would say in terms of just interacting with the music community as a whole, we've done a couple programs that are specifically targeted towards the music business entertainment sector. Mm. Um, some of which were specific to uh, musicians helping them think of themselves as entrepreneurs. Uh, we've partnered with the Arts Council, the Downtown Development District. We actually produce a pitch every year that's for arts-based businesses, majority of which do end up being music affiliated. So that happens every year during New Orleans Entrepreneur Week, comes with a $25,000 prize if you guys are interested. 25K? Yeah. Just to have an idea that wins. A, a good idea. A great a well idea. Well thought out wins. idea, but yeah. 25K plus resources, so like uh, help with marketing and branding, a couple pro bono legal hours, sometimes it comes with office space, it depends. But I craft out a lot of those for different industry specific uh, okay. sectors. So we do one for ideas and water, we do one for ed tech, uh, we do one for actually female owned businesses mm -hmm. in partnership with the Urban League. So it just kind of depends, but every year they look and feel different. You keep busy. One, one quick thing, your website's up. Where would I go to find out about the events you do? Okay, so <laughs> I actually don't love our website, but if you look at this What We Do tab, uh, if you click Idea Institute, that will tell you, oh, nope, go to the uh, right hand, nope, get out of there. Sorry. Okay. Nope, go down, go I down, go down. Institute. Yeah, yeah, click that. If you click Institute, go down some more, our website hides things. Uh, 2014 season calendar of events. I think you two need to work together, right? Well, we, I just told him we're doing a web redesign right now. I need to talk to him. Um, so yeah, so this will just kind of show you from a very top line level just cool. what's happening, which is not the best place to see it. The best place to see what we're doing and like what's happening throughout the, the year, go to Get Involved, mm. register for Entrepreneur Services. So if you go there and just get a username and password, that's how you actually access all of our programs. And I would say probably 95% of people who actually come don't even come to our website. They just go straight to the login. Um, and so that's where you'll see any of the consulting programs that are available right now, all of the workshops, keynotes that are coming up, um, as well as any networking events. Awesome. OK. That's a lot. I gave you a mouthful. I'm sorry. There's a lot of <laughs> stuff going on.
can I, can I one, one indirect um, thing that the Idea Village does is that it, aside from all of the great things that they do and like purposely like you know result driven things it allows people to realize in New Orleans that they can do what they want to do so when I went to I, I was an intern at the Idea Village a couple of years ago but this year when I went to Entrepreneur Week I was just looking around like I was just sizing everybody up and I was like I could do this like he getting 50k he getting 25k like I could do it and so, um, and I, I, like she says, I do attend a lot of the classes, but it just kind of lets you know, like, oh, you can do this too. Like, these people, are, you know. You can just walk into one of these classes and. I mean, if you, like, like how we're sitting on this stage, we aren't really, like, you know, special. Like, y'all could do the exact same thing, like, yeah. right now, probably sure. better than, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So, that's an indirect result of the yeah, idea of like the ripple existing. effect of what the work is you're doing. Yeah. Um, Take that back to Tim. Oh, well. <laughs> For next year's accelerator, <laughs> uh, Blake. Um, so this is this is like deep stuff you're working on. You, you're tell tell me again. You're measuring what? Well, measuring's a you know. Okay. That, that's a rough term now right, for us right, academics. Right, and right. Don't ask me what value I'm adding. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> so, so what I'm and of course. One of the things about doing ethnography, for those, you know, ethnography is in sustained engagement with a community or a network of some sort in, in order to, you become part of them, but not really, to learn what matters to them. Is was Jane essence. Goodall doing ethnography? I'm sorry? Jane Goodall, was she? You see, then, then I am not qualified to just say what is and isn't okay. ethnography because people get really picky about this. You so know, I've had people tell me that I'm not doing ethnography because I'm not spending enough, I didn't move far away enough, okay. essentially. So, you know, I'm. I'm, I'm going to. So the moral here is there's a lot of particular things yeah. in academia. Yes, but okay. academia can be very picky and they, they care about their choice of terms. In any case, yeah. I'm participating and I'm observing and I'm interviewing. Those are the three right. main aspects of ethnography. And, and who is it you're working with? I'm more oh, a variety of people and I'm more. Um, there's, they call it snowballing. So I'm following my leads. Yeah. So if I meet someone, I ask them, you know, what's important to them. And then so I've met musicians or people have invited me into different sites. But to backtrack a little bit, mm -hmm. so I started on a private file sharing site using BitTorrent. So it's a private BitTorrent tracker. I call it Jekyll. I can't for ethical reasons tell you the real name of it, but it's very popular. Um, it primarily shares music. At the same time, I also have begun, I moved to New Orleans, back to New Orleans from Oxford. And, and please, that's an aside, my email is Blake Durham. After this, if you have any interest in talking to me about anything regarding being a musician or a music consumer, please email me. This is how this works. Um, cool. Um, I've just started in New Orleans seeing the impact of different music distribution systems, mm. um, whether from the consumer level or on the producer level. So I'm mainly talking to people about Spotify, but that's kind of just evolved naturally because it's in the news a lot and a lot of people are talking about it. So I'm asking people about, mm. well, what do you think about Spotify? Mm. And then it's gone from there. And I've, um, so I have those two aspects of my work. The point, um, I'm studying a lot of different facets of it. Um, one of the, some of the themes that have come out are, I mean, I guess the shortest version is what exactly we always talk about, oh, this digital revolution, or we shouldn't talk about the digital revolution, but oh, you know, there's a revolutionary new technology that comes in and it changes the game, but we tend to not examine it closely and say, what does it change? Um, how does it work? Why did it ta take off? Why is it going away? Like you and I were saying, um, mm -hmm. and I come into private BitTorrent trackers at a kind of unusual time because yeah. you could easily make the argument that they're dying, yeah. even though it's growing. It's just growing. It is a, growing. Or it depends on how you measure growing. Okay. But the actual amount of data that is tracked by uh, Jekyll is greater than it's ever been at this point in time. There are more files in circulation. Right. And there's been, they've kind of leveled off at 160,000 users, although there's been almost a half a million users. And we're talking a site that's private. We're not talking Pirate Bay here. You know, yeah, this a, is a site that, it, it's like one of these you have to go on the weird old school internet relay chat. It's again yeah. a quiz about like how MP3s work and stuff. Yes, and then or you can get in through an invite. So there's uh, there's multiple, but the main 
it's particularly notable and well known as being. Um, it's like a dark interview. underworld of MP3s. Yeah, yeah they, um, <laughs> the dark net. If you've heard people talk yeah, about the dark exactly. net, I hate the term and I refuse to use it because okay. it's ridiculous and it makes it. no sense. <laughs> but they do, there's this sense of people used to think it was about security. Mm. But this is an ultimately one of the things I'm finding is it's not really about security, it's about community and it's about economy. There is an economy, and a tracker economy, there's a pirate economy, and of course that's always been known that you know when people are selling bootleg CDs, that's an obvious economy. Um, and if money comes in, they have to get the CDs from somewhere, so it's easy to trace that. Mm. It's a bit harder, and then people don't do it quite enough to track the uh, economy of file sharers, where money isn't obviously being exchanged. But on the, the difference between public and private, say, so Pirate Bay versus what I'm looking at, is that um, you have to contribute. You have to upload. You cannot snatch. You will be disabled if you snatch and refuse to share it back. You can't just leech off the you can't. Yeah, you can, you can leech. You can leech five gigabytes, actually, mm. to start. They give you a, a waiver, but you will get disabled, and you will never get back in. Mm. So, um, And there's incentives. So the more you share, the more you, you can invite people. You get new features and access to higher-level communities. So there's oh, this whole tier and hierarchy to this, and people get very very, very involved. It's almost like a game, like you're building something. It is. I, I've compared it exactly to a game where people compete for imaginary internet points. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, this is, that's also not... Um, it's real. This is one of the funny things about the internet. Almost every community, a forum, you know, I'm a, I follow a forum to get my news about the New Orleans Saints, and people mm -hmm. play it like a game. You know, there's, mm -hmm. you know, people game the internet, and I'm not sure. I haven't you know, of course, these are these overarching themes that I have to provide a philosophical reason for. But more to the point is I'm observing it, and I find it fascinating, and I don't quite understand it. And that's what's neat about having several years to work on a project like this and a PhD, is you get to talk yeah. to people and ask them why they think it happens. So I'm curious, just to ask you a follow-up question in general. Yeah. You were in this program. You were sitting in forum for four yes. years, more or less. Yeah. And mm -hmm. <laughs> Now you're doing a PhD program, yes. which I think is fairly unique among our graduates. Yeah, I, I, there's a lot of graduates that do grad school. I would, I would right. say we have a lot of MBAs in law school, and I mean, I don't know. Um, but a PhD is a different game. Yeah, a PhD obviously. is a, a different game, sure. It is, um, yes, a lot of the things that you have to do to succeed in grad school are directly applicable to a job. You have to view it like a job. Well, yeah. that's the first and foremost thing. So you, you cannot view it like high school or college. You know, you, you have to get up and you have to do things and there's no one bossing you, telling you what you have to do. Sure. But if you do not do it, you fail. And you have to go move in with mom again. So, you know, there are... Um, so, so if you're in law school, you, you try to be an attorney. If you're an MBA, I don't know what you really do. But <laughs> if you get a PhD, what do you want to do? I, oh, I mean, the majority of, all right, in my, at Oxford in the music department, there's no one that is not looking to be, become a professor right. afterwards. You know, academia is um, incestuous in that capacity. Um, but I would love to, or I ideally will, engage a bit more with industry, in a sense. I've, um, or, you know, in, in terms, you know, and I'm speaking broadly, I want to teach. I've always wanted to teach. I knew that coming into this program, it seems like a weird match. I always have cool. anticipated teaching at high school or um, university level. At the same time, I'm, I'm not, I don't have all my results yet. I mean, I'm only halfway through my program. But when I'm done, I think I will have learned some things about consumers sure. that people who make music need to understand. Mm -hmm. And some of the things I find people may disagree with and not want to hear because I'm not overly optimistic about what I'm finding, mm. but it's also, it's, it's relevant information, I think, mm. to people making music, putting it on Bandcamp and expecting to become famous or expecting to make money, you know? I mean, that's what it seems like you're headed toward is like, we're, we're all in this moment of like, everything's changing, things are on Bandcamp, people are listening to all their music on YouTube. But it's like, what really happens in two years? We can look back and say, like, iTunes, you know, sort of flatlined. It, it seems really fascinating, like, where is it all going? Yeah, and I, I, if I had that answer, I wouldn't, you know. Um, <laughs> you wouldn't be here now. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 it would be, I'd be very lucky if I found that rich. answer. But I do think we, we hit, we're in this weird state where we're, con it's, you know, um, my supervisor coined this term called mobile stasis. So it's, it refers, and she used it in terms to a, a musical aesthetics. But the, the concept is something that is 
appearing to constantly change, but actually staying the same. And I find it really applies well to what I'm finding is that people are constantly saying things are changing, but I don't know if it's that different from 2008, except people buy less CDs. I mean, the same concepts apply, but in 2008, when I was recording music in my dorm room and trying to figure out how do I, what do I do with this? Right. I think that if I was making it today, I think I'd have the same problem. You know, I do think that we encounter a lot of the same problems, and so things are changing, but a lot of things are also staying the same in a, in a, in a, in a, in a sense, I don't know. I don't want. I don't want to get too speak too strongly on that point. But I think that's what I'm finding: are people new services are coming and going, and people are getting music, but we're not seeing the flows of money return from the '90s. Right. And I don't, you know, and I don't know if that's going to happen. Or I, or I should say, I would bet my money that that won't, we will see the trend downwards. Okay. So that's what I get from consumers. Right. And I, we can. I'll have more to say later if you want to see yeah. some things about how people value music. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Okay, some cautionary words from Blake. Well, <laughs> in the sense that, or if you want to, if you think, if you think you're going to get away with selling a record for ten dollars consistently, right. the people I'm interviewing, and they're not representative of everyone, right. but these are people who are seriously into music, and so you would hope they would spend their money on this, and they simply will sp are spending their money literally everywhere, but their music. Even though that's because they're paying, and one of the points is that there's an economy and they're paying for music with other things. And I know that sounds weird, but they're paying for it in, so with cultural and social capital, so like prestige, and they're paying for it with their time, and, their, um, and they create communities to share their music. But I just don't, not meeting people who buy a lot of music except in physical vinyl formats. That's okay. really the only thing I'm buying. So, Alex, you have musical projects, right? Well, yeah, but I wanted to say, so like you said, <clears throat> you know, it seems like things are kind of staying the same. So are we not seeing that, um, you know, are we not just going back to like, just like live music being king? Because like you said, uh, the sharing and promotional services come and go, but the live thing is something that, you know, you can make music, but now you have to actually go out and, and do it. And you have to go out and tell people to go see it. And so, like, I think that, you know, for me, I don't buy music at all anymore, but I will definitely, and I think people will always go and see a live show. Do you fund music? Do I fund music? I mean, you want your consumers to be funding music projects. Yeah, right? so we have actually these two girls, two cute little uh, girls. They, I found them in the French Quarter. They play ukuleles. Okay. They spin fire and hula hoop, <laughs> right? Not from New Orleans, but they came to New Orleans and they street perform. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we do fund music projects, and actually with crowdfunding, that, those are the most projects that actually get funded, are music projects. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say that like in the music industry, and I'm not an expert, I did some stuff, I threw some concerts after college, but uh, I would say that it's all more just about entrepreneur, like being an entrepreneur. You can't be a, a musician and just think that you can throw your music up on this site or just submit it to this uh, record company and think that something's gonna happen. I think everybody understands that, but it's the facts. Like, uh, you gotta really know that. And uh, so like the Idea Village doing stuff for people in the city, crowdfunding, and then I guess the research that you are you are doing now is gonna point and tell people that, you know, you have to actually be an entrepreneur. You have yeah. to be a businessman. You can't just be a musician. Brett, could I ask you a couple of practical things? Just totally being an artist on the web, you talk about all this really complicated stuff and security and everything else. I mean, does that, I know it applies to bigger companies and certainly companies like Bandcamp or whomever who have certainly, yeah. big web operations. <laughs> Independent musician, does this matter? Is this something that? It matters in one respect. And you know, I do realize I get, I'm pretty far down the rabbit hole in a lot of this stuff. It's like, <laughs> right. I, I forget it's my fair. audience sometimes. Um, you know, the, the thing that I would say is that you just need to be aware that it, it's not, uh, these things, they, they work several layers deep. So if you're, if you're putting something out there, you know, you think about how your music sounds to people, when you think about how like, your live show sounds to people, you're concentrating on the dynamics for everybody in the room, not just the person right up front who gets it, right? Websites are the same way. You know, you've got as many different types of people visiting your website as there are in this room. And, you know, multiply that by thousands, hopefully, right? So you've got to understand how that presentation, how that functionality, how what you're offering comes off to those people. And 
you know, the nice thing about the web is that there's, there's numbers right there to show you, right? Um, so to launch anything today without a sense of how it's being received, I think is yeah. sort of foolish. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, Google, Google puts these tools out there for free. I mean, the certification exam for their analytics package, it takes maybe three weeks to study for it. You can now take that for free. It used to cost like 10 grand or something. It was really expensive. Um, you know. So what's a practical suggestion? I'm an artist. I want to be more data driven. Like, who do I sign up with? What's the service that's going to help me out? Just put Google Analytics on your website. Just, okay. Just do that. Okay. And then, you know, the interface is easier to understand than ever before. Mm -hmm. No, you know, you probably have a single spot on your site or on Bandcamp or whatever. Most of these other services support integration, you know, with Google Analytics because it is obviously the primary one. You know, make sure you know how people are getting to the point where they hit buy or how many people have gone to the event listing for your next show. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's going to give you some sort of reasonable predictor as to success. And give you a chance to maybe change things and experiment a little yeah. bit. Yeah. And you don't, need to know, you don't need to know how to code to do this stuff. There's a step-by-step -step on, you know, go, go to analytics, googleanalytics.com or google.com slash analytics, <laughs> I think it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Grab the snippet and just put it on your site. I mean, it's the first step. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a great recommendation. Could you give a recommendation for crowdfunding? Um, as far as for these how folks to do in it. the room, just one like key point about. Um, so make a plan. I mean, just like with life. So crowdfunding. Anybody who's thinking about doing crowdfunding, first of all, my tip is to use Fundat. Um, my second tip is to make sure you have a plan. So you need to have an email plan. You need to have a social media plan. And you need to have a project update plan. And you need to have a reward plan. That's perfect. But let me get down in the weeds. Like, give one like super pro tip, right? Because you're the expert. Um, so, I mean, to be honest with you, what I've learned is that you just, you have to work it, you know? It's, it's really promotion, it's marketing. Yeah. Uh, having a strong social network helps. 80% yeah. uh, of what you raise comes from your network, so people that you know and that you're connected with online. People you're already connected with, 80% of your funding. Whether you're on now. Kickstarter, Indiegogo, any, any platform. Okay. Um, That's... That's so if, you're not, if you don't really have a, a big network online, you're kind of going nowhere with crowdfunding. Well, not necessarily. If you don't have a big network on a social, you may not have a book, big network on a social network, but you may have, you probably have a lot of people that you have emailed over the last, you know, however long email has been out. Um, <laughs> so you can reach out to those people. Email is, yeah, so email and uh, those type of direct connections with people produce the most results. Okay. So you should be emailing people once or twice every week. You recommend? For email, like once or twice every yeah, week. yeah. But what program? Mailchimp. Oh yeah. Well, that's the one I use. That's the yeah. Yeah, Mailchimp. Okay. That's all I can recommend. Yeah, it's it's a good one. Yeah, yeah. it works. <laughs> okay. It's free. Blake, any recommendations to to folks here, or maybe? Can, what about recommendations for people considering graduate school of any sort? That's that fabulous. Yes. So I had um, um, a former professor here. I think, I'm pretty sure it was him. Um, when I told him I wanted to do graduate school, the first piece of information, or the first piece of advice was don't do it. And then, if I, you know, really don't do it, don't do it. And if you still think you want to do it after mm. I tell you that you don't want to do it, you mm. might want to do it. If you can be convinced easily that you shouldn't do it, really don't do it. It kind of sucks at times, you know, it really, um, I'm 26 and married, and there are days that I wish I was, work and then there are days that what I'm doing is very rewarding mm -hmm. and um, the main thing I would say is you have to you really do have to start <coughs> early oh, because what graduate school you go to matters and anyone who tells you it doesn't doesn't know what they're talking about no matter what program you are doing yeah. it doesn't I don't mean the rankings that you can find on the website on you know on US news or whatever that they matter sure um, but more importantly a good fit if you're not a good fit, whether it's your law school or, or MBA program or if, you know graphic design masters, if you're a bad fit for what the program does, you will hate it. And I've seen people who are, you know, I shouldn't say failed. Some of them failed. Some of them managed to get a degree but cannot use it. And it really comes down to fit. Mm -hmm. It comes down to people who, like, if, you go, if you're going to work with a supervisor, you need to identify them by junior year, probably. 
you need to get in contact with them. You need to explain what you what your goals are, what um, and see how you get along because that's another weird thing is that you might yeah. have someone who has the perfect research interests, but a difficult person to work with or doesn't respond to your emails and. You, I've seen people quit their PhD programs because they can't get along with the supervisor, and that seems really small. Mm -hmm. And it's but it's those, or you have to be more flexible. That's yeah. the other thing is you know if you have a super you know, so there's you have to be know what you're getting yourself into. That's the main thing, and that means doing a lot of research, and also learning how to write, learning how to speak, and learning how to manage your time more efficiently than you did in college because. You know, you you actually do have to learn how to work not off of deadlines. You know, be self-propelled. Yeah, you really have to, yeah. or you'll never get anything done. It's just and you start. Know. You said think early, so junior year even thinking about. Oh, I, I can't imagine. Like I'm saying, if you really want to get into the right program to do whatever it is you want to do. Say Oxford. If you wanted to get into Oxford, I don't, you know, I'm not. You know, that's. Once again, it gets weird. I got yeah. rejected from a lot of schools yeah. that you would, if you were going to make a list of the great universities, I got rejected from ones that are way down on the list. Yeah. Cause, and it's not, it's not that I'm brilliant and I you know, blew everyone away. It's that they saw me and they said I wasn't a good fit. You know, they didn't like what I was doing. And you they, fit quite well in this. In I, this I do group. fit. Um, yeah. It's the only reason I'm at Oxford. I'm, and if it weren't for my supervisor, Oxford does nothing like this. Oxford is a very old school, conservative yeah. place. Sure. Being in a music program means studying, you know, you know, you know, opera or you know, you know, they're cla they're historical musicologists primarily, you know, and so this is. So it's kind of like finding your match, and then yeah, it's like online dating, and, and and that, that comparison comes up again and again. And not just online dating; it's like dating. You yeah. you have to find the right yeah. match, both the school, the person, and even the location. You do have to decide if you can. Put up with living, and you know, <laughs> uh, you know. I, had, I once again, I had a friend who moved yeah. somewhere very far away from his family, and he quit at a master's, even though it was the perfect fit in all other capacity. He just could not live, and I won't name the state in case some of you are from here. But he just couldn't. He couldn't handle it. You know, it's too cold, and, and, and you know. And so all those sorts of things matter, yeah. and they really do. And, and too many people think they can just go to graduate school wherever, and it'll result in jobs. That's the other thing. Going to graduate school, school does not get you a job, no matter the grad school. Yeah. Um, so if you're looking to get a job straight out, networking it remains just as important as if you get a bachelor's. That doesn't change. And that used to change, apparently. But no, it doesn't help now. I'd agree with that. Yeah. And if they want to talk to you about your research, just grab you afterward. That works. Great. Victoria, give us some advice about entrepreneurship and what you might recommend for these folks in the program. Yeah, sure. I think. Um, any advice I would give probably falls down to two points. Like first and foremost, like it's about hustle. So I think anything that you're doing, regardless of whether it's you know getting a job after college, launching your own venture, taking your band on the road, it's about hustle. And I think a lot of that kind of starts in this room. Like I can't tell you how many people I've actually built business deals with that I was in this program with. Um, so like really pay attention to who's in the room, who are you, who's in your classes, what are the skill sets you can leverage for what you're doing right now and what you want to do in the future. So definitely. Hustle. Um, take advantage of the opportunities that are at your fingertips. Uh, some of the connections I made doing things like, hell, going to France with Sandy Hinderley from Meet M, uh, made some connections that I still have to this day. Uh, so take advantage of these like random things your professors are telling you about. Like You think it doesn't really add up to anything. It might just be some cool thing to do on a Saturday. But those things really do add up, and those connections really do make a difference. Uh, the next thing I would say um, is just really approach anything you're doing like a business, uh, whether that's you know launching your band's next CD or actually like you know managing a project at whatever job you have when you graduate. Uh, I think that's part of the reason why I've been successful is just everything I do, I look at it like a business. I think about how I need to market it, what's the audience that I'm trying to tag, uh, what's the budget, what's the best way to allocate the resources, whether they're financial or not. Um, and I think anything you do, you need to approach that way. And even just speaking to your personal brand and how you approach things, those are all an extension of you know managing yourself like a business. Um, so just be very cognizant of the, you know, way you're handling yourself and the way you're handling your deals. Nice. Where, where, where are we, Kevin? What's going on? Take a question or two? We have time? OK. Let's take a question or two. People. Yeah. <laughs> Adam's up there in the middle, I think. <laughs> Can 
kid in your exercise every Monday. <laughs> Um, just for the blue shirt in the middle, hi, I forget your name, I'm sorry. Um, Blake. 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 <clears throat> what do you think the next technological step is going to be for music sharing? Is it going to be more internet based or is it going to be something more physical? Um, What's the next this, format, you think? I, you see, and of course, I, well, no matter what answer I give, I'm going to be wrong because you know everyone who has tried to predict these things ends up being wrong. So I mean, I'll, my shot is that I would, if I had a million dollars and I wanted to invest it in something, I'd put it in, in. Well, I wouldn't put it in streaming services because they're not going to make money, but they will be used. So if I was looking for where, I mean, I just that's too many people find them useful, and I don't. If that's where I think the streaming services are where it's at. At the same time, do I think they're the best? Do I think it's ideal? No, I really actually don't. I. Um, I think an evolution of peer-to-peer -peer sharing would, is the most efficient way to distribute, if we're just talking on a technical level, how to get files from one computer to another so that people have music they want to listen to. I do think larger capacity devices with and then peer-to-peer -peer sharing is the most efficient, but I don't think that's going to happen. Is, is that good? <laughs> We have four amazing alumni here. No one has a single question. <laughs> um, my question is for Blake as well. Um, you talk about setting the consumption. So if you ever reach that kind of aha moment and get the results, I guess, that you'd hope to get initially when you decided to start setting the consumption, um, what then what would you do with the results? Um, well, I couldn't hear the end of that. I'm sorry? I couldn't hear the end of your question. I said, so what then? What, what would you do after you get like the results that you anticipated? Um, I think, at least, and uh, other people have agreed with me, when, because I have this amount of time set up, you know, I have over a year, I can take a year and a half for my results. Every time I have an aha moment, I view it kind of as, as a plateau, meaning, OK, I've discovered something, and then I've the week later, someone's told me the exact opposite, and that guy didn't know what he was talking about. You know, um, as far as an aha moment, I've had lots of weird aha moments about the fact that the particular community I'm studying is a real community. You know, and so that's been really striking because I have generally been dismissive of. Um, my readings in digital ethnography and the way that people have studied online communities as if they're the same as re you know offline communities and some of, I, th I felt a lot of their, their they took a lot of logical leaps because they wanted to say oh the internet's just like the real world and sure it is but it, you know I have a hard time believing that you know the community that forms around the idea village is as powerful as the one that's on wow you know your wow guild you know I just didn't see that um, as far as so let me sum this up aha moments I've had um, a lot but the main aha moment is for me is talking to people and realizing the amount of money that's spent around music uh, spending a hundred thousand dollars on a stereo system but not buying the music, you know, and, and not spending, you know, the $10 to buy the new high res Pink Floyd album, just refusing to buy any, you know, do that whole um, buy it in yet another format. I mean, that just blew me away. This guy has disposable income and he's still pirating, you know, and that, that was a real aha moment for me. Cool. All right, time to go to class. Give a big round.